So um, welcome to our talk uh, on uh, on micro credentials um, and uh, recognition. My name is uh, Fabrice Tenare, and I'm the CEO of uh, Inquahi, and I will have the pleasure and honor to chair uh, this session. Um, and uh, we, we Inquahi has been organizing uh, Inquahi talks for a couple of years now. It is the tenth uh, Inquahi talks that uh, we are uh, offering to uh, the tertiary education and quality assurance community. Um, you may not be so familiar uh, with our network. Uh, Inquahi is a worldwide association established in 1991, and we have more than 300 members uh, active in practice and also theory in quality assurance in tertiary education, composed of uh, external uh, quality assurance bodies, tertiary education institutions and uh, some individuals spanning all continents. We um, uh, co we serve the interest of the quality assurance uh, community through uh, research, evidence-based analysis, like the global study on trends in quality assurance that uh, we have launched, and probably many of you has received the links to, uh, to respond to our online uh, surveys. Funding for projects on capacity building and research as the call for applications have been set um, uh, this uh, week. Also external reviews of quality assurance uh, agencies, technical assistance and various workshops and other capacity building activities. So we uh, are particularly uh, uh, honored to uh, organize this in Quahi Talks uh, 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 today uh, with the uh, uh, um, uh, participants who should be majority majority from the uh, American continent. Of course, we, of course, we welcome all the participants. But uh, we we had this uh, in Quahi Talk uh, one week ago, and regarding uh, the interest on the topic, we decided that we would uh, organize it again. And uh, we are pleased to do so because more than 42% uh, percent of our membership uh, is from the Americas. So uh, from uh, North Canada to uh, South uh, Chile, meaning uh, 8,000 8, 8, miles, we have a lot of members. And uh, we, are, uh, we are more than 100, 130 participants today, which is uh, uh, very, uh, very good. And we are very pleased. This is... Uh, uh, thanks to uh, the dissemination of the information and so the mobilizations of, uh, of uh, our networks and specifically Real Coup. And we should thank he, uh, Ariana de uh, Vicenzi. Real Coup is a network for Latin America Caribbean associations of private universities, as well as other networks that we have like uh, Chia or Konahek and uh, also many others. So um, we feel uh, uh, quite well positioned and privileged to host this inquiry on micro credentials uh, um, for uh, uh, different reasons. The first is that we are, as I said, we are launching the uh, external reviews of agencies against the international standards and guidelines. And these uh, standards and guidelines, which are following uh, um, the, the process of uh, guidelines of good practice that you may have already heard of. Now we're using the international and guidelines to review externally the agencies. And uh, um, we have, we are proposing some specific modules to uh, better address uh, how external bodies uh, operate in some fields of quality assurance, specifically uh, internationalization, digital education, and we have a specific modules on short cycles and micro credentials. So we are very uh, pleased now to offer the external reviews against uh, 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 specific standards related to micro credentials because I will see uh, uh, today it's uh, it's an issue uh, concern and challenge for uh, many of us. And second uh, is that Inquahi has gained some uh, experience through recent research, such as the one conducted uh, with UNESCO on micro credentials in the Asia Pacific region, spanning eight uh, uh, different countries, and to explore how we could build uh, trust in these uh, new programs and uh, certification. 
So as you know, macro credentials is a, is a new and vast uh, topic. And our aim today is to better understand uh, what works uh, and uh, what have been the processes uh, micro credentials have developed around the world, um, allowing us to put uh, the, the into perspective some experiences from three different zones. Uh, North America through Ontario and Canada, Asia through Hong Kong in China and Japan, and finally uh, the European uh, standpoint with the European higher education uh, area. And you will see that rather than um, a series of presentations, we decided to opt for a conversational mode among the panelists to, to make this uh, webinar uh, livelier. And uh, um, we, it's through the combination of uh, the various point of views from various experience that uh, we will try to identify what works or how to, to make it work when it comes to quality assurance for uh, micro-credentials and uh, recognition. So to accompany us in this discussion, uh, we have brought together four top quality panelists. The first one is Dr. Mary Catherine Lennon. Uh, she uh, has been a board member of uh, INQUAHI, and she's the head of research and special projects at the Post-Secondary Education Quality Assessments Board of Ontario, PECAB. We have Dr. Christina Ng, Senior Register at uh, the Hong Kong Council for Accreditation of Academic and Vocational Qualifications. We have Professor Rhee Mori, Professor at the National Institution for Academic Degrees and Quality Enhancement of Higher Education in Japan. And we have Dr. Esther with us, Head of Quality Assurance Departments at the Catalonian Span Spanish Agency, ACU. So the, the webinar will uh, unfold as follows. We'll start with a short introduction on the macro credentials by Marikat Lennon. And Marikat will uh, continue by uh, providing uh, us with some insights into the Ontario frameworks for uh, quality assurance. And then, this, this uh, introduction will be followed by an understanding of the various conte contexts in which the macro credentials have been developed in these three geographical zones. And we will continue with a, 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 a set of question and answers for our panelists before I open the floor uh, to chat uh, with uh, you as uh, participants. So you know a little bit, uh, thanks to uh, the Secretariat, about the uh, in, um, the interpretation modality. I just uh, remind you that uh, we have on purpose muted all your microphones and also your camera have been uh, uh, disabled. Uh, however, we are very keen to hear from you during the presentations. And of course, uh, when we open the Q&A uh, session, and you can use the Q&A uh, function to ask uh, questions, uh, provide comments. So even though we have uh, uh, inter simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, uh, it may be easier for all of us to use English when you ask the question. However, you're still uh, free to uh, ask it uh, in Spanish and don't worry, we will manage that. So without further ado, I'm excited to kick off this uh, webinar and turn it over to Marika Lennon. Please, Marikat. That's great. Thank you so much, Fabrice. And, and thank you all for joining us today. It really is a pleasure to have the opportunity to share the experiences that, that we've all been going through in the development of regulatory quality assurance models, the development of models, frameworks for micro-credentials in our different jurisdictions. It was when we were developing the intentions for this presentation that we recognized that despite the different ways in which we were going about tackling the issue, we all were dealing with similar challenges, um, similar complications, similar issues that revolve around micro-credentials. I'm gonna put up a slide here if you'll bear with me. There we go. Um, th these are the sort of the, the controversies and the issues that we're all going through in our in our own different in our own different ways in our own different jurisdictions, and these are the things that we'll touch on as we go through our different our different approaches. But 
really, we're all grappling with the issue of this jungle of micro-credentials. We have micro-credentials that are short, that are long, that are one hour or 150 hours. We have micro-credentials that are targeted for access purposes. So, you know, someone who is perhaps not completed higher or not completed um, secondary education, who sees this as an opportunity to get into further education, be it a college um, vocational program or be it um, or be it a university program. We also know that there's a variety of employers that are involved in the provision of micro credentials. The providers are not just higher education institutes where we as quality assurance agencies or regulatory bodies, we're quite used to dealing with those institutions. We're dealing with the wild west of providers where it's industry, it's professional associations, it's community associations, it's industry who are engaged in supporting this lifelong learning, upskilling, reskilling. And we wanna be able to support that, but we wanna be able to do it in a way that is um, measured that is going to protect our learners, our students, that's going to protect the reputation of our, um, our higher education systems, that's going to be respectful of the education and the learning experience of the individual, and ways that it's going to be meaningful for labor market, for employers, for professional associations to trust the training, the education that the learner is bringing to their next um, opportunity, be that in the labor market or in academia for, um, for staffing purposes. We, we know that many micro-credentials are um, desired to be integrated into existing credentials, qualifications and being able to do so in a measured way that allows students and the learners to be able to do that is something that we think is important for lifelong learning. And all of us in our various jurisdictions are dealing with things like qualifications frameworks, if we happen to have them, which sort of set the framework for ways in which the formal education system is um, laid out and offers roots to formally recognize micro-credentials. In situations where we don't have qualifications frameworks, there are other ways in which uh, the jurisdictions are trying to signal the legitimacy of certain programs. We are all going through the, um, the balancing act of internal and external quality assurance. External quality assurance needs to be, and internal quality assurance needs to be commensurate with the short program, anything too burdensome is not going to be appropriate for a micro-credential that is intended to be responsive to labor market needs, um, you know, something that can be quickly turned around and provided to reskill and upskill. So recognizing that and balancing that is something that all of our jurisdictions are going through. And the final piece that, um, that I believe all of us are going to touch on is that recognition piece. How do you legitimize the education coming from this variety of providers in a way that's meaningful, in a way that's recognizable by the employers, by the professional associations, by the um, educational institutions, and by the students themselves so that they understand what they are buying into when they register for a micro-credential, so that they understand what they are, um, what they are achieving or, or seeking to achieve. So I think all of our presentations are going to touch on aspects of this, and I'm going to now share with you what we're doing in Ontario. Yes, thank you very much, Marikat. Yes. Okay, okay thank you. Other you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Every we can see everything. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So, so in Ontario, it's um, it's been a priority for our government for the past sort of three, almost four years now, to support the development of micro credentials, and there have been millions of dollars to uh, to support the development of of these through existing employer employers and industry and private providers 
as well as existing educational institutions, public institutions, colleges and universities. They've also developed a framework for um, student assistance, student financial assistance to help students participate in these programs. They realized in these activities that there was still an ongoing need for some sort of clarity around what a micro-credential actually was. And so they came to PCAB. We are an arm's length government agency in Ontario. Um, you, may, you may be aware that education and higher education is a provincial jurisdiction in Canada. And so we are part of a provincial system of higher education. We're one of a number of quality assurance agencies um, with responsibility. And they asked us at PCAB to provide a recommendation for what a quality assurance framework could look like. And, uh, and we've been working hard in collaboration with our sector partners to develop something that we think will be useful, in something that will be valuable, and something that will not be too onerous to implement at the institutional side or the government side. And our first process really was to identify what the problems were. And our main problem was a lack of clarity. What we identified as the issue is that there, the onus is really on the student to presume the value of the investment in the educational experience. So they have to guess whether or not something that is one hour or 10 hours or 150 hours is going to have some value for them. And they won't know that until after they have received that credential, whether or not their employer or their industry association or an academic association is going to value that learning experience that they've had and whether or not they were going to receive any sort of academic credit for it. And so we recognize that there is a need for some formal recognition of programming that validates the students and gives them an opportunity for um, a clarity of what their options are, confidence that they will be recognized, and a, value, and a validation of their educational investment. And our solution was to propose, because I say this is a proposal. Sorry, I've just had the, the translation pop up on me. Is that is that just me? Should I keep going? Okay, I'll keep going. So our solution is a protected micro-credential term. Or that's our suggestion. It could be a legally protected term under the Trademark Act of Ontario that can be applied to some micro-credentials. This trademarked term would signal an educational rigor. It would signal a specific duration. It would signal that it is provided by authorized providers. And those providers can be industry, employers, or professional associations. The term and an Ontario micro-credential can be integrated into existing administrative and reporting databases, and it can be stacked or it can be signaled that it can be stacked. And this is how we propose to harness what's going on in micro-credentials. We can't change what's going on and we can't, we can't manage the, the chaos of provision, but what we can do is put a little bit of a corral around something that we can, we can control and we can control in Ontario micro-credentials. And how do we do that? Well, we treat it the same way we treat all of our credentials through a quality framework where we have, we are lucky in Ontario to have a qualifications framework, which provides transparent parameters for credential expectations. We also have existing quality assurance mechanisms for external and internal quality assurance processes. And we already have recognition processes in place that um, legitimize achievements for learning experiences. I'm very briefly going to um, to go over our qualifications framework. I'm just going to check my time. I won't spend a huge amount of time on it, but I think this visual aid gives a little bit of an indication on how we are um, proposing to capture what a micro-credential is, to put a little bit of the, the parameters around it. After extensive consultation, we determined 12 to 40 hours was appropriate for a micro-credential. Typically, a credit is worth about 12 hours of seat time. We don't have an existing um, credit transfer system or um, credit system. 
beyond seat time. So that's essentially what we've used. We also think that there is absolute value in articulating the academic level of a micro-credential so that there's a clarity of whether or not the educational rigor is at a certificate level, sort of pre-diploma. If it's at a diploma level, sort of targeted for professional purposes, or pardon me, vocational purposes. If it's at the bachelor's level or if it's at the master's level, where we're really talking about very technical, um, high level programming so that students know clearly what education they're getting, employers know what they're getting, and institutions have a very clear idea of what type of education the student is seeking credit for. The providers that we, um, we have in Ontario currently with quality assurance agencies would be eligible to provide license, uh, they would be eligible to receive a license to provide Ontario micro-credentials. And, um, and we have proposals for how private career colleges and industries and employers and professional associations can work to achieve that Ontario micro-credential status for their programming. Finally, um, we believe that the recognition of micro-credentials is critical. We think that they should be stackable. No, no, pardon me. We think that where it is appropriate for them to be stacked, it should be signaled so that students know that this educational opportunity can lead to further opportunities and can be recognized in a formal credential. So we think that there's an opportunity to use this OMC and an OMC plus status as a signal and a means to support academic credit transfer. Because this would be recognized as a credential through the institutional databases, it would be treated the same way that any other credential is treated, validated and portable into any of the existing databases. And, um, and these, are the, these are the sort of core elements that we are proposing for the Ontario model. Really, our goal was to balance priorities. We wanted to recognize the importance of learner choice, learner protection, employer needs, educational best practice, the simple signaling with an OMC, with a sophisticated process building upon our existing quality assurance internal and external processes, in institutional autonomy to make the decisions about curriculum, and system coordination so that we all have an understanding of what we're talking about when we speak of an Ontario micro-credential. So that is, that is the model that we are putting forward and we're excited to see what the, um, what the next phase will be. Um, but I will, um, I'll pass it back to Fabrice so that we can learn from yep. our other colleagues what's going on in their jurisdictions. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mara Kat, and uh, you're perfectly on time. So thanks for that. Thanks for the insights into uh, uh, the situation in Ontario. And um, so we'll have also time to ask uh, questions to Mara Kat uh, during the Q&A session. I suggest that now we directly go to uh, Hong Kong uh, with uh, Christina N, who will uh, share um, uh, with us um, an overview of the national context uh, there and progressed and the uh, main issues. So, Christina, please, up to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, let me just share my screen. Yeah. Um, so, thank you and uh, good evening, everybody from Hong Kong. Um, my name is Christina. Christina, um, you're muted or I can't hear I'm you. Muted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes? No? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so um, I'm, I'm from the Hong Kong Council for Accreditation of Academic and Vocational Qualifications. It's a very long name, but um, so this name tells that uh, we cover both the academic and the vocational sector. So there is only one um, qualifications framework in Hong Kong and one accreditation uh, accreditation agency. So that is uh, HKCABQ. Um, now, this is uh, my favorite um, mind map. Uh, so, and here uh, we have, uh, you know, very uh, some key questions. So we can see that uh, on the top right-hand side, we have uh, the question about what micro-credentials are. And so that relates to um, the uh, 
the definition uh, that so we we need uh, to look into a definition for micro credentials and um, so uh, why are they important so we need to think about what uh, are the purposes or needs um, of uh, stakeholders for micro credentials and so in the middle is this something new um, so we need to think uh, you know to, to uh, also um, reflect on our existing proficiency whether uh, we have such um, such type of qualifications uh, in Hong Kong already and the last question is, how do they relate to traditional qualifications? So in this sense, we need to um, think about whether we have uh, sufficient um, facilitation for credit transfer, for uh, uh, stacking of these uh, qualifications into formal qualifications. Um, so at this stage, we want to use the most simple understanding on micro-credentials. Um, so they are short, small, uh, with focused content relevant to industries, and uh, the uh, there's a great deal of flexibilities in the delivery mode, and um, so they are uh, it's basically demand driven, and uh, being a credential meaning that um, it is quality assured. Uh, with uh, transparent information, the uh, the qualifications are. Uh, assessed and they can be standalone, they are recognized and they can be transferred. So are these new or do we have micro-credentials in Hong Kong? The question is yes and no. Now we can uh, have a look at the qualifications framework. Um, so here in Hong Kong, we have uh, uh, seven uh, QF levels, seven levels on the qualifications framework. And these, uh, each of these levels are defined by the generic descriptors uh, under four domains, so knowledge and uh, intellectual skills, processes, autonomy, autonomy and accountability, uh, communication, numeracy, and so on. Um, so under these, uh, with these uh, uh, generic levels, uh, descriptors, we can um, put up uh, qualifications, or we can recognize qualifications uh, in different sectors, including the academic sector, vocational and professional sector, and also the continuing education uh, programs. So all the programs recognized under the qualifications framework are put on the qualifications register. So these are the qualifications on our register. So you can see that on the left-hand side, those uh, color-coded ones are what we call the formal qualifications, and they are specified with uh, QF level and also uh, the uh, Q, uh, the size, the, the credit size. But um, the rest are what we call the other qualifications. Now, these other qualifications uh, can be very flexible. They can be pitched at different QF levels, and uh, mainly there are two types. Um, diploma and certificate. Now for a program to be called diploma, it has to be uh, at least um, 60 QF credits. Uh, we have uh, one credit equals to uh, 10 notional learning hours. So 60 credits roughly um, represents uh, one year full-time study. So if we uh, use 60 credits as a, a line, uh, as a cutoff point, we can see that um, on the QR, uh, over 50% of the qualifications are less than 60 credits. So if we define that as short programs, I mean, something less than one year full-time study, then we have around 50% of qualifications uh, you know, at this level. And, and in fact, um, around 92% of these are short qualifications are actually uh, less than 30 credits, so they are really very short. Um, and uh, most of these uh, qualifications, 99% of them are pitched at Q, uh, QF level one to, four, uh, one to four. So what does that mean? It means that uh, we have a large number of qualifications uh, accredited on our register already, and, and they are mainly uh, pitched at lower levels. So how do we uh, recognize them? Now, that is an illustration of the key issue. 
So we have the formal qualifications. So now uh, we would like to see these qualifications to create more flexibilities. We want to see the, how these qualifications are unbundled into smaller qualifications on the right hand side. But at the same time, we want to facilitate the small qualifications so that they can stack into the formal qualifications to allow um, learners to uh, to stack to transfer uh, what they've learned um, uh, with greater flexibility. Um, so in Hong Kong, we have the uh, policy for credit accumulation and transfer. So under this policy, we have eight generic principles. So these are very generic principles like uh, promoting learner mobility, uh, transparency of information, um, decisions uh, made uh, based on learning outcomes, uh, re uh, respect of uh, um, institutional autonomy, um, and, and, and so on. But the main thing is um, the adoption of the CAT policy is entirely voluntary. So it doesn't mean that everybody have to have uh, credit or to accept credit transfer. So if we look at the qualifications on our uh, qualifications register, we can see that actually 65% um, of um, the qualifications, they do not accept credit transfer. And uh, even for those who accept credit transfer, it's only just uh, an institutional policy. That means in principle. And um, only about 4% of uh, programs, they have very clear um, credit, uh, credit transfer uh, arrangements. So in other words, the take up rate for transfer is very low. So we asked the institutions, why do they not accepting credit transfer? Mm -hmm. So they uh, provide a number of reasons, including um, you know, lack of uh, curriculum information, uh, they are worried that they lose control of um, the intake quality. And also, uh, it's very difficult to find partners uh, with institutions to arrange for transfer uh, or some uh, something to do with the impact of their branding or the competitive edge. Um, so that created a lot of reluctance or from program uh, personnel. Um, so we also asked the institutions uh, whether they want to develop micro-credentials and almost 100% of them say, yes, they are very positive about the development of micro-credentials. And they give us uh, um, you know, some examples of their plans. So including like uh, unbundling their, um, you know, the existing programs into modules or embedding uh, micro-credentials in new programs or convert existing um, you know, CPD programs into micro-credentials and so on. And also to um, enhance their internal guidelines to uh, facilitate credit transfer. And uh, they are also eager to um, collaborate with industries and other institutions to uh, facilitate uh, credit transfer. But at the same time, they also tell us that uh, they foresee a lot of challenges uh, in this um, development. For example, they, 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 uh, we still don't have a clear definition of micro-credentials in terms of the size and so on. And uh, the stacking rules uh, is not clear at the, at the moment. And uh, we uh, do not uh, have a, you know, a clear policy on the recognition of online programs on non-formal learning. Um, so they wanted more support. So. Right. One minute, please, Christina. One minute. Oh, okay, oh, okay. okay. Uh, I need to... Yeah, they wanted more support on program design and also they wanted us to make it more uh, clearer on the uh, requirement for QA, especially on the uh, accreditation process. So uh, at this stage, we decided that uh, we should uh, leverage the existing framework because this is something that we've already developed. For example, the QF credits, the levels, the seven levels, the, the register, and also the QA um, mechanisms. Um, so what we need to do is to uh, enhance the existing framework to incorporate the uh, micro-credentials. 
So we still have a long way to go, but we are moving forward steadily. And uh, we want to ensure that all the, the, uh, the needs of uh, all stakeholders are addressed. So um, I'm, uh, I'll stop here and uh, maybe we can uh, um, discuss further in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Krishna, for, for, for this. And uh, actually, yes, we'll have a question if you want to elaborate a little bit on the on the framework. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I suggest uh, we stay uh, uh, in uh, the Asian region and uh, we will uh, now pass the floor to Ri Mori and uh, Ri will uh, explain to us the national context for micro credential in Japan and the progress made there. Please, Ri. Thank you, Fabrice. Do you hear me all right? Good. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Ri Mori from Nayad QE Japan. Actually, I'm in your tomorrow. It's already Saturday in Japan. Uh, okay. Uh, so the today's theme is navigating future learning, recognizing micro credentials, and in discussing the future of micro credentials, let me start uh, my presentation by asking a question myself, which is, uh, the official micro credentials in Japan, and uh, my answer to this question is, this is me myself. Oh yeah, it's not it's not very clear. Let me explain why I am this ambiguous. As of today, there is no official definition of the micro credential in Japan. Meanwhile, there are some practices conferring so-called micro credentials by individual higher education institutions in Japan. So uh Actually, the qualification is lacking, and the lack of qualification has already touched by Christina and Mary Kias uh, in their presentations. <clears throat> Therefore, <clears throat> uh, again, uh, in the context of Japanese uh, higher education, before you start talking about market credentials in Japan, you are supposed to clarify what you are talking about. So let me try in this rigors. This slide is based on my speculation about the definition of micro-credentials in my uh, higher education system. What I suspect is so-called micro-credentials are the credits, not the credit, but the credentials or the, the seal of learning outcomes smaller than credits. They are micro-credentials that, uh, that many people are talking about. Uh, and I'd like to ask the opinions of all participants today that if we can call a credential which is bigger than a credit but smaller than a degree, a micro credential or not. Uh, in the Japanese uh, situation, we have both kinds of size of micro credentials and the one which is bigger than credit and smaller than a degree has been officially recognized and that is called certificate in English I'd say and and uh, also there are uh, many uh, micro several micro credentials that are uh, conferred by individual universities with no no official recognitions. So the situation is not quite organized in Japanese higher education. So, uh, and I took the um, example of smaller micro-credential of the as offered by the Open University Japan, and they use the uh, the digital batch of IMS global format. It's an, a more independent attempt. And the Open University of Japan uh, used an IMS global format. And meanwhile, there are uh, several digital batch systems being uh, innovated in this country. And uh, those attempts are 
to unify the digital system of micro credentials and uh, some uh, front runners are competing to win the, the status of, um, let's say, uh, the uh, de facto standard. Hmm. Okay. Okay, uh, let me change the focus a bit. Uh, we are, NIAID QE is a member of INCAHE, which means that we are accreditation body in Japan, one of the accreditation bodies in Japan. But uh, even before we start uh, the function of accreditation or quality assurance of higher education, we were established to award degrees to learners who are not college students based on the independent credit accumulation, the, uh, the credit accumulation and transfer system, which exists in Hong Kong and actually uh, HKCAVQ, Christina's organization, and NIAID QE, my organization, has some ideal uh, source from the CNAA in the United Kingdom. In any event, uh, we still award the bachelor's degree to learners who are not college students, and they are supposed to accumulate not micro credential but macro credential which are credits to earn a bachelor's degree and we confer degrees in 60 concentrations and 27 major fields including the 60 concentration uh, include the mechanical engineering nursing judo therapy if you understand what judo therapy is and the physical education or french literature uh, german literature Rus russian literature you name it we have it and uh yearly recently we award, award our around 2500 bachelor's degrees a year, yearly and uh, of course this attempt is kind of non-traditional uh lifelong learning high education system we've been dealing in, with in the last more than 30 years. And based on our experience in awarding academic qualifications in an innovative way, we have learned that securing trust is essential. So in order to pro promote, if you want to promote micro-credentials, we need clear workload determination because uh, in terms of macro credentials such as credit or degrees, common sense may work. We have just learned that from Christina's presentation, it's not always the case, but it's uh, still easier to understand than micro credentials in which common sense may not work well. And uh, so the the workload determination may be needed and level determination, where I mean that at which degree level the learning or the micro-credential has happened uh, may be needed in order to secure the traceability of learning to guarantee the stackability, making the smaller chunk of learning to a bigger chunk of learning or the creden credential to uh, make sure the authenticity of my cred credentials themselves to, and to ensure opportunities learn a larger chunk of cred credentials to, 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 con to continue the, the learning or further uh, directions. So to clarify, uh, from where the micro credential comes and to where it takes you, I guess national qualification framework may help, I guess. So another question of my uh in my presentation, this is almost the last slide, is that is there an official NQF in Japan, national qualification framework in Japan? And my answer is again ambiguous. And actually, technically, we in Japan, we do not have national qualification framework, but quite recently, uh, NIAID QE, my uh, colleagues, issued a tentative version of Japanese education qualification framework, which you can 
find on the link and understand the, the slide of the presentation of this uh, event will be will be uh, provided afterwards. So uh, in terms of micro credentials, Japan is in a slow mode of development, but it's still happening. So uh, I'm so happy to be here with you and uh, I'd like to learn a lot from you. Thank you very much for attention. Okay, thank you. thank you very much, Ray. Thank you very much for this uh, this uh, presentation. And uh, I suggest that uh, we now directly go to uh, Europe and uh, to Catalonia, Spain, uh, with the uh, Esther Huerta's presentation. Um, after that, we'll have a couple of questions, and I will open the floor. But Esther, take your time in presenting um, the context. Thank you. Hello, good morning, good, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you see the slides? Okay, thank you very much. So good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today to explain the experience of the Quality Assurance Agency, which is the agency responsible for the quality assurance of higher education in Catalonia, region of Spain. And at the same time, it's, I would like to say that it's a challenge to, to talk after the previous speakers because they have already said a lot of things and, and I will try not to repeat myself on, on some of the ideas they have already highlighted. So my presentation is going to focus on, on one particular and, and very small uh, experience um, uh, of the system because the higher education system in Catalonia was involved in designing and, and short learning programs in order to flex, to have a flexible pathway to access the tertiary education. And I'm going to try, I'm sorry, it's not working. Wow, okay. I'm going to, to try to answer three main questions. What are, micro-credentials from the point of view of the European higher education area. So we, though we are going to see a lot of similarities as uh, our previous speakers have already said, why we're so relevant in, in our context and why we choose a special characteristics of short learning programs and how was implemented all, all the process. And I will focus a little bit more on, on the quality assurance elements. So when talking about the definition of, of micro-credentials, um, I have chosen the definition of the European Commission because they had, by the end of, of uh, 2021, the European Commission defining a Euro defined a, a European approach to micro-credentials. What it said that a micro-credential is a, a small record of learning outcomes that a learner has acquired following a small volume of learning. So in general, this is the, the, the definition that, that we understand under the term micro-credential. But there are more elements that we should bear in mind when talking, when talking about uh, micro-credentials because uh, this framework, this approach of the European Commission includes another characteristic. For example, the quality. Micro-credentials should be um, quality assured internally or externally or both, depending on, on how the things are evolving and designing. Uh, it is really important that transparency, and when we talk about the transparency, we are referring to the workload of the macro credential, the qualifications framework, and also the information that should be embedded in, in the micro credentials themselves, also the relevance because we are, we are having a um, approach really focused on, on the labor market needs. And obviously it is really, really relevant to focus on the design of um, intended learning outcomes. Micro-credentials should be understood as a way of providing flexibility to the learning pathways. It is really relevant for this um, um, and all the policies that has been linked to the lifelong learning. 
they should be really focused on, on the learner. Uh, and another um, characteristic that it's uh, important is the recognition as previous spe speaker has already said. And when we talk about recognition, we are not only talking about the recognition of that micro-credential in the official program. We are also referring of the recognition of that, that micro-credential in the labor market. So, uh, micro-credentials, as uh, Christine has already said, um, are not new worldwide. We, we, we already have micro-credentials, but right now they have increased their interest a lot. View this um, interest and perspectives coming from the policy makers, the employment services, tertiary education, etc. So, how was um, implemented this uh, project in the in Catalonia in this uh, in this part of Spain? So, uh, in 2020, we began to design uh, this this pilot of short learning programs, and this demand comes from the Barcelona Digital Talent, which is a, a consortium of different public and and private organization that identifies the gap in the ITC fields. So this uh, organization um, decided to bring this uh, challenge to the Catalan government and pretends to uh, look for a solution to the workforce to, to have a better training of the people of the workforce. So there was a high interest to have a, an upskilling or or and reskilling of the of the workforce of of Catalonia. So this uh, problem, this issue, was sent to the Catalan government. The government uh, decided to work with different ministries that were really linked to the labor market needs. So we've got the the public employment service, the continuous training consortium, and the higher education system in Catalonia was also involved there because the, the idea was trying to design a vocational training for employment of more specialization. So under this idea, the, there was um, the interest was to design a micro-credential belonging to a level uh, six or seven of the European qualifications framework. So we are talking about level of bachelor and, uh, and level of master. So the higher education system in Catalonia was really interested in the project. They found very, uh, well, they were really committed in, in, in the project. And also the, the agency was, was also involved because of the, uh, the quality assurance of the high education uh, system. So when we began to work, there were a lot of challenges. The first one is that in 2020, there wasn't a clear definition on what was a micro-credential. So we have to work with an idea of, uh, of this type of provision. Um, also, there was a challenge on, on, on the project itself on how to work with different ministry, but in order to reach one goal, one specific goal. And another challenge was to, to know if the high education institutions were going to be as fast as necessary to provide the answer that uh, the labor market needs. So we decided at the end of this pilot, we decided to to work with uh, with short learning programs with a strong applicability. And there were three main fields that we were working with, the ICT field, renewables energies, and auto automotive and sustainable mo mobility, uh, mobility, sorry. So all those courses, those short learning programs uh, belong to level six and seven of the European Qualifications Framework. I have to say that most of them were linked to bachelor level and in two special cases belong to master level. Um, the short learning programs that were designed 
uh, were between 4 and 15 ECTS, though the uh, we defined that the, the, the length of the mic of short learning programs could reach until 30 ECTS. Um, there was also the idea that those programs that were validated by the agency that were um, analyzed following our procedures and following the European standards and guidelines, that they could be recognized in official degrees. And in the project, we only have into account the higher education institutions. So the alternative provided, providers were out of the scope of the project. Um, when talking about the quality assurance, we decided to, to work with, uh, with the exant evaluation. So we evaluate all the programs, all the short learning programs. And this could be uh, obviously criticized. And, and we were the first one that we didn't want to choose this exante evaluation of program by program. But we have to follow this methodology due to the special procedures of the public employment services. That requires an evaluation of the design previously to the registration in the National Catalog of Professional Qualifications. So that was one of the experiences that we've got with this project. I have to say that, not, that now we have moved to the institutional evaluation, and now we have uh, revised our methodology that the certification of the internal quality assurance system, and we have included uh, the, the micro-credentials in the methodology. Okay, so I think that I can stop here and later on we I can answer the question yes. anyone have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. Thank you for your presentation. And um and uh, yes, and then I think um we we can we can start uh, the the question and answers, uh, but uh, uh, b before uh, and to have a kind of a conclusion, uh, conclusive uh, uh, um, uh, so, um, um, to have some remarks, final remarks by by our our panelists. I would like to ask the uh, uh, the question on uh, the main issues that you see uh, related to quality assuring the micro credentials in your context. So we have the micro credentials on one side, and we have the the quality assurance on the other side. And you presented you know, the 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 way. You you try you try to uh, quality ensure these micro credentials. So if you could sum up, um, you know the main uh, issues related to these quality assurance of micro credentials, and then we could uh, we could open the floor. Um, Marika, would you like to start? Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you uh, very much. I. Again, those, those presentations are so interesting because they are so fundamentally what we are dealing with in my jurisdiction in Ontario. The one thing that um, that I think I would want to bring forward as sort of a, a point of consideration is that in the Ontario si situation, the Canadian situation, we find that a lot of our um, individuals enrolled in micro-credentials are those already in the workforce? Are those already with post-secondary education? And so engaging the professional associations as partners mm -hmm. in supporting micro-credential legitimization, we think is really important for, for two reasons. One, these professional accreditation agents, professional accreditation bodies that deal with healthcare that deal with um yeah a lot of healthcare that deal with education for example they have professional development expectations mm. that are um very easily transferred into micro credentials which would simplify their recognition of education for the individual for the professional accreditation component the other, the other piece of that professional industry relationship that we think is really important is that large industries, I think about places like Google or IBM or Hydro Ontario, this large corporation that's responsible for the hydroelectric system that keeps our, our jurisdiction running. 
they have professional development. They have training courses for their employees. The opportunity for them to partner with an institution to ensure that there are clear learning outcomes, curriculum that is validated and valued, that there are assessments and that their employees might be able to have that professional development programming recognized for academic credit or recognized within other within other industries or with other employers has real value for both the industry employers as well as the individuals who are taking the courses. So the the conversation that we've had today has really been about our traditional higher education systems. And I think we also need to branch out into recognizing the very significant role of alternate providers mm -hmm. in our higher education landscape for micro-credentials. Okay, thank you, America. Can I ask the same questions to uh, to uh, Christina, please, in uh, in one minute only, please. So many, okay, I'll try my best. Okay, yeah, um, so I think in Hong Kong, uh, as I explained, so we already have a lot of. I mean, our our uh, qualifications framework covers both um academic and professional and vocational qualifications so we already have a lot of uh, short programs uh, uh developed and accredited um so i think the issue is similar to ontario that we need to um reach them uh to i mean to 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 uh, uh to facilitate the transfer of these uh, uh credits um or uh, short qualifications into the formal system the formal education system um so for for recognition um so uh we uh basically uh we have um you know all, all the uh, infrastructure built but uh, we want we we need to really address uh what do learners um want to do with the micro credentials whether mm -hmm. they want to have it um for uh for for further education for stacking or whether they want to have the um you know the, the the, the recognition in the industry. So this is uh, something that we, we need to uh, work for, uh, work on. And uh, our problem is that, or maybe our, not not really a problem, but our, our decision is to um, work on the existing uh, infrastructure. And uh, right now, uh, accred mm. our accreditation is program-based. So we need to find a way to make our accreditation more responsive to the um to the need uh of the market so that um you know um providers they can launch a uh, new and short qualifications um to meet the you know the ever uh, uh developing demand in the market so i hope yes. that's that's more yeah. than i'm sorry for that <laughs> thank you christina thank you pass over to Ri in japan please and then esther okay thank you very much uh my disclaimer is uh, my answer is based on my speculation because the 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 reality of micro credential giving is not uh, so busy in Japan, but uh, I suspect that the, the if a micro credentials has been issued by higher education institutions, we can apply the existing infrastructure that Christina mentioned to uh, to aid uh, the existing degrees or uh, credit programs. So uh, in terms of the, uh, high, the providers at higher education, I don't worry about it that much. Probably we will be start thinking more seriously about the, the QA of micro credentials when other kind of providers from the business side mm. comes into the scene. That is what I guess at this point of time. Okay, thank you, Esther. Yes. Um. So it is really important to to bear in mind that that we have some tools to to warranty the 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 quality of 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 micro credentials and and we have to use those tools um and those tools we've got some uh, procedures etc and 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 standards and guidelines etc 
but those procedures provide trust to the society. And that's really, really important because it's the basis of everything. So I would say that quality assurance is relevant. They provide transparency and trust to the society, to the, to the labor market, et cetera. And we've got other elements that we should bear in mind. For example, in, in the European higher education area, we've got the European standards and guidelines that they contribute to develop a common understanding in the system. But there are other contexts with other standards that can be used and will be really helpful to apply. So um, that's something I would say of high importance. And, and, and well, that's it. I, I would provide this idea. For me, it's the most relevant one. <laughs> Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Esther. Uh, so, dear uh, dear colleagues, uh, you can uh, use now the the Q and R uh, section rather than the chat. It will be easier uh, for us. Um, uh, but I have uh, already a, a couple of questions, and uh, um, uh, one is interesting is about um, how to best combine uh, the the academic programs and my co credentials. And uh, in our in your frameworks or in your practice, for those who are already already started, uh, uh, did you have that uh, reflection um, on what could it be complementary or substitute to uh, to the uh, classic academic programs? I don't know who would like to uh, to uh, to take the floor. Trying to comment on this. Marika, yes. Mm -hmm. And then Esther. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, one of the one of the things that, that we think would be helpful to support the integration of micro credentials into formal qualifications is um, is the quality assurance process that establishes the academic level. Mm -hmm. And that changes micro-credential evaluation for academic purposes from PLAR, prior learning and recognition assessments, to a much more straightforward credit recognition. Because even though a micro-credential in our framework anyway, wouldn't automatically have credit value towards a larger credential, it has clarity for opportunity so that any program mm. can look at it and determine because of the clarity of learning outcomes, because of the clarity of assessments, where the academic value might be placed. And so for, for us, it's a transparency that the quality assurance process provides to micro credentials that can support the integration of it into larger credentials. I will just say on the at, at the outset, the other value of quality assurance is that quality assurance looks at end of program outcomes. And so any quality assurance process, internal quality assurance process, would naturally look at all of the components mm. that create the, yes. the, 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 final, the final components of a program. And I suspect that those internal processes and the external valuation would not support an entire, an entire degree, for example, to be comprised of micro-credentials. Mm. Some sort of expectation on residency requirements of 50% or 70% at minimum would need to be core programming supplemented by micro credentials. Okay, Marika, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with uh, Marika. It's 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 something I would like to highlight. It's really important the quality assurance. It's really important to validate the learning outcomes to validate the the qualifications framework of that micro credential and and i would say the workload associated to 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 that short short program um having said that it is we have to bear in mind that the recognition process it's something internal of the of the higher education institution so there could be really excellent external quality assurance. There could be really excellent internal procedures, but at the end is the higher education institution or the tertiary education that at the end should decide if they are going to recognize these or not. 
So there's a, an autonomy there. So that's another important thing here. And, and also we should bear in mind that there are some, uh, in some places that it's not permitted to have a program built only based on these stackable micro-credentials because in some countries the, the legislation said that the program, an official program should be uh, built in another way. So that's something that we are, I think that this is something for the next future, how the higher education uh, is going to change in the next future. But I, I will leave, leave it hit here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Christina, you want to, to add that? Yeah, just to add to um, the, the two uh, speakers, um, I mean, for us, uh, I mean, we, we see that, uh, I mean, all, all the qualifications are already quality assured in Hong Kong, but um, we can see that the, uh, you know, the acceptance of uh, credit transfer is very low. I mean, the pickup rate is very low. So there's a lot of concern. Um, I, I mean, the transparency, the, uh, you know, um, information about our learning outcome, uh, about assessment is definitely uh, a concern. And um, and also uh, the, at the other end is that, um, you know, um, for example, the program design, the formal uh, qualification like the bachelor or uh, the master's program, um, the original design, they have to uh, have room for, for the transfer, for accepting, um, you know, the modules from outside. Um, so this is something also uh, very important, uh, you know, in, in the process of uh, the development of micro potential to ensure that, um, you know, programs, they can really, uh, in the design, uh, uh, able to accommodate uh, transfer from qualifications outside. So this is uh, something that we, we, we need to work on. Okay. Um, we have uh, uh, some questions or, or, or comments related to to, uh, to what you're what you're doing. Um, either um, the the micro credentials should be quality ensured by the institutions themselves, to the extent that they have a robust and trustworthy internal quality assurance system, or should it be done by external quality assurance agencies like it is done for other kinds of, of programs. And the other comment related to this one and, and raised by, by uh, Michael Bracho is the fact that uh, there are lots of providers, including from the industry, from corporations, and which are not related to tertiary education as we know, and uh, then they're not quality insured by the, uh, by the agencies. So uh, in your uh, reflection, have you, have you touched upon these two issues, internal, external QA, and what do we do with the micro credential uh, providers that don't belong to the higher education sector? We'd like to, Ri, you would like to? Thank you. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, the the first question about who is responsible for, for the quality of micro credentials if it is uh, being conferred by higher education institutions? Of course, both both of higher education institutions and external quality assurance organizations uh, because uh, even the credits and degrees conferred by the traditional types of credentials conferred by higher education, people needed something external to make sure that the quality level is kept, has been kept. So uh, I, believe that uh, the more innovative mode of credentials, uh, micro-credentials may need, of course, internal and external systems to assure the quality. And uh, the industry conferred micro-credentials, I guess, uh, in our context of Japan, if those micro-credentials are stackable to mm -hmm. form either a credit or a degree, I guess the high education QA system would step into the process. Again, this is my speculation. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Mary Cap, you want to complement uh, yeah, this comment, yeah. please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. They're, they're great questions and they're something that we've 
uh, mm -hmm. bo both the question about, you know, internal or external and the issue about how do you deal with external providers to our, you know, our regulated systems. They're, they're key questions and the things that we've been working through. So our solution, our proposed solution right now is to build on the existing external regulation, external quality assurance of internal processes to recognize the internal expertise when it comes to curriculum development, learning outcomes, being assigned and assessments. And we think that the internal expertise is much more significant and would be much more valuable than an external agency um, trying, trying to conduct that independent of the expertise at that, at that very niche level. Um, and we think that the role of external quality assurance and regulation is to ensure that the processes are in place that will mm. maintain that quality, that they're asking the right questions, that their processes are in place to ensure that there have been checks and balances. And so yes. it really is, it's that trust mm. that, that Esther mentioned earlier. I mean, we, we have to trust our institutions. If we trust them to provide bachelors and masters and PhDs and vocational learning, why would we doubt their capacity to provide these short programs? The um, the other question that, that was brought out regarding external providers and how do we yes. incorporate them, manage them? Well, in, in our situation, we value, absolutely value what they bring to the education the training for um, for whatever their industry may be. But we also recognize that they don't necessarily have the curriculum design expertise to mm. develop learning outcomes, to create assessments that are appropriate for a master's level or for a diploma level or for for those sorts mm. of those sorts of things in order to make sure that they are able to be integrated into higher education. And so our solution to that is to promote, suggest, encourage partnerships. Mm -hmm. I know that so many jurisdictions around the world are, are very, very strong in their partnerships. We in Ontario and Canada, we're not great at bringing industry and institutions together. And we think that this is a real opportunity to take, mm -hmm. to take expertise and curriculum design and bring it together. Um, thank you very much, Marika. That goes also with a comment made by uh, one of our participants that um, that uh, micro credentials may be also a, a piece of a wider program and uh, and allow for more uh, um, lifelong learning opportunities. If we can, if we could accumulate micro credentials, transfer them, and then enabling a higher level. Uh, uh, recognition or deeper recognition, but to do that, you, we probably need also to to work as higher education much closer to uh, to the employers, to the uh, to the industry. You no, know? and so it's the question about about having that opportunity you new know, to trigger lifelong learning, uh, not only through programs but also with these pieces that are uh, macro credentials. I don't know if you agree. That was more of a comment, but I found interesting. Is there? Yes, uh, that's right. That's that's the idea. The, the formal program should have some um, place for uh, having the recognition of micro credentials. What is really important is that those micro credentials are really focused on the workflows, workforce. Nonetheless, the, the, there are other type of micro credentials can that can be more focused on social aspects, et cetera. But the focus we've got right now in, in Catalonia and in Spain, it's a focus really uh, on, on, on the needs of the labor market because there's a strategy mm -hmm. for um, having a better employability and have employability with uh, better conditions and doing um, tasks with more difficulties. So we need this lifelong learning for mm -hmm. upskilling and reskilling people that is already working in 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 the in the system. Okay. And yes, that's that's very, very important. 
Okay. I see. Um, there is also these comments on uh, on the definitions. And when you started uh, your presentation, you all insisted on the fact that uh, we needed to be uh, clear about the terminology. Uh, so we see there are some, some I don't know if it's a misunderstanding, but at least a needs for clarification between several types of uh, alternative programs or this kind, like badges, for instance, are they similar to micro-credentials? And also all kind of uh, new programs that have emerged uh, during the pandemic and and uh, thanks to uh you know to the uh, expansion of uh, digital uh, education and uh, some ask you for instance if uh, we should uh, further explore the qualifications of micro credentials within the framework of black black blockchain um you see technology blockchain um so um yeah, and 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 uh, I have the impression that the, yeah, the 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 scope is vast, and we don't have very clear definitions. But maybe we we will never get to to a clear definition. Uh, the 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 modalities are so are so different. But I understand that on the other hand, we need also to come to a consensus about what it is and how we quality ensure this. So my question is, how would you see how to balance, you know, to keep that diversity alive? And and, uh, and and trying to have some reference points so that at least we could quality ensure nationally and also internationally. I don't have the answers. I I, I have the privilege to raise the question. Marikaf, bring it up. That's my question. I, I I think you've just hit the nail on the head of the this the, the problem that we've been grappling with in Ontario is there is so much going on that how could we possibly manage it? How can we possibly contain it without um, squashing innovation? Mm. And, and our solution was was not to try to organize everything, but to carve out a small space where there is consistency and recognition and validation. And then everything else can continue. The badging can continue. The professional development can continue. And not intending to devalue that, but trying to um, trying to contain a little piece of it mm -hmm. that will give um, a little bit of academic value, professional value. Um, for those that are interested in doing it, because we recognize yeah. that, you know, anyone can put something up online and, and have it mm. available. There yeah. is going to be a process mm. by which quality assured micro credentials have to go through. There is an investment in time and, and effort. If there is value in that from the institutions, from the public, from the industry and employers, we'll see that. Mm. And that's what we're hoping for. Yeah, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. now you want to add a word? Thank you, Mary Kat. Christina? Yes. Um, I think um I mean uh, when we when we think about definition, I mean probably the, the first question is the size. Yes. Um I, I don't think that it really matters. Uh I mean whether that is uh, four credits or sixty credits, it's just uh, you know a line to draw. But um, to, to define micro credential probably is uh, you, we, we should pay more attention to to the purpose. Um, so how should we facilitate um, the purpose of micro credential? For example, to uh, facilitate the credit transfer into the formal qualifications. Um, so that that is uh, that 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 is I think what we should more focus on. And then the second thing is. Um, in Hong Kong, uh, as I said, we already have a, a large number of short qualifications. Um, but uh, as we talk to institutions and also uh, to industry, probably they they wanted to see uh, when we define micro credentials, we wanted to see the you know the nature of um, you know these short courses and uh, the purpose of having these uh, after taking these short courses. What can they do with with them? I think that that is, uh, you know, what um, what we gather from from um, the stakeholders. So um, mm. 
and 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 also uh, in terms of the uh, uh, information, the transparency of information. I mean, digital batch is just a way to present the information. And that's true. Uh, so blockchain mm -hmm. is another way to present the credential. Um, but uh, the you know um, the, the the purpose of the credential itself is the essence that uh, we we need to pay attention to. That's true. Thank you, Christina. Yes, Ri, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I agree with Christina when she uh, mentioned the importance of digital badges or digital records because we have already stepped into the wild, wild west and it, probably we are a bit too late to to make an, uh, a sort of a, a framework which benchmarks the, the workload needed for a credit. For example, this micro credential is one third of a credit in Catalonia, things like that. And probably we are too late to do so. So what we can do at this point in time is to record the source of learning and uh, the workload and the purpose and the value into a digital record so that uh, it, in a various uh, size and various lengths of time and so that the uh, receiver of the credential can look through the contents of the digital watch to decide, okay, this can be received to the, the purpose of this mm. applicant or, things like, or, or whatever it is. And probably I, I think we have to rely on the, the informatics to promote and the, the QA, the micro-credentials. Again, that is my speculation. But we're coming uh, to an end of our webinar. I may uh, share a question or comment uh, with you. It's about the social dimension of micro-credentials and the fact that uh, for many countries, access to higher ed education is always uh, an issue. And so uh, uh, to the extent that micro-credentials are, are financially affordable, it may be you know, a new pathway to access higher education. Um, any 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 comments on on this or insights into the social dimension? Yeah. I mean, I, yes, <laughs> is there is there Christina? And then yeah, my credentials, as I think that previously has been said, it's quite quite open, and I'm really agree. I agree totally agree with Christina that it depends on the on the aim of the of the macro credentials. So. That's one thing. But what we realize with our experience is that through the, those short learning programs, um, also there could be some uh, learners that can have their first experience in a high education institution. Mm -hmm. And this was something valuable and it was something like a, an idea of the government and to permit this pathway and having this experience and maybe having those learners yes. once again back in the yeah. higher education system. Yes. So that's another that's idea great. coming. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that, that was another idea. But of course, it has some difficulties, but it's a way of having contact and, and, and try to have the, those people involved in, in, the, in, in, in higher education. Okay. Okay. Christina, in 10 seconds. Yeah, 10 seconds. Uh, I think that this is also a, a trend and also one, uh, you know, a plan of the higher education institutions that we talk to. They will unbundle their programs uh, to uh, to become uh, micro credentials so that learners can take their time and uh, and uh, and uh, take the, the uh, uh, short qualifications at different stages of, uh, uh, of time um, and then be recognized back to the formal qualification. I think that that is one of the purpose of uh, having micro credentials. Okay, Mary, have you? No. Okay. Yeah, I'll just I'll just say very very briefly that there there is sort of a, a consideration and a risk with uh, with micro credentials. Um, presuming to take on the role of a larger credential, where there are additional elements that you don't get in a very short program: the depth, the the theory the um the exposure to difficult content that it, 
I guess there 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 is a risk with micro credentials um, taking on the just in time training and educational needs as opposed to a broader educational purpose. Um, and that unfortunately tends to target those that are already at risk. So it happens to be those that are underrepresented already that perhaps are of lower income or um, in rural areas, for example, who are less likely to engage in full-time programming that might see this as an opportunity, but the return on investment might not be as substantial as investment in a larger programming. So that that's just something to to okay. consider. Okay, Re, 10 seconds. Yes, yes. Uh, in every, when we talk about an uh, innovative ways of higher education, we have to take talk about the access and quality. Again, we are facing that problem and uh, we can see that, that uh, we share the pro program internationally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Re. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think this uh, webinar is, is coming uh, to an end. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank our four panelists, Marika, Esther, Christina and Re, for sharing uh, your, your insights and the uh, listeners you've, you've learned. Uh, special thanks to Christina and Re for staying up late on, their, uh, on your Saturday. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marikath, uh, who is not only a dedicated uh, Inquiry board member, but also a key contributor to the Inquiry MPL Center for Research and Capacity Building. You deserve our appreciation. Thank you so much. We are also grateful to our two interpreters who help uh, with the simultaneous uh, uh, interpretation that we're doing for the first time, and also for the support of the Inquiry Secretariat. And once again, I would like to, to uh, uh, highlight uh, here the value and uh, the engagement of uh, our uh, uh, sister partner, Rea Culpa, who uh, managed to uh, uh, attract uh, many participants. We have 12 uh, um, countries from South America and the Caribbean represented uh, here uh, today. So thank you very much uh, for your uh, uh, mobilization. And also we, we reach out to uh, other countries, uh, Europe with uh, Hungary and Cyprus, Portugal, but also Pakistan and South Africa. So as you know, we will share uh, the, the slides and the recording. Uh, shortly, we will answer to the pending questions uh, uh, that uh, are, are um, uh, posting on the Q&A uh, box. Um, next uh, November, we have another inquiry talks and uh, we will inform soon about the subject. It, will, it may revolve around employability. And I take the opportunity uh, of, uh, of uh, these concluding remarks uh, to remind you not to forget to respond to our online surveys for the global study, which is available in eight different languages, including French, English, and uh, Portuguese, and Spanish. So I think it covers all, almost all the languages for the uh, Americas. And uh, let's keep in touch and uh, have all a very nice weekend. Thank you very much, all. Thank you. And take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Gracias a todos y a todas.